everyone, welcome back to another episode of Boys in the Cave. My name is Tanzan and I'm, a, I'm your host for today. And today I'm joined by a very, very special guest. Um, shout out to uh, one of our podcast listeners that actually connected me with um, this very, very special guest that we have on today. So D- Danish Qasim is the founder of InShakes Clothing. He has 11 years experience working with victims of spiritual abuse. Danish began a formal study of the Islamic sciences locally in 2006. Upon graduating in 2010 from UC Berkeley, he dedicated himself to full-time traditional Islamic studies. His overseas studies include uh, Mauritania in the school of Marabat al-Hajj, Rahimallah, and studying with scholars in Istanbul. In 2019, he finished his master's focusing on spiritual abuse in the Muslim context. So, assalamu alaikum, Danish, and welcome to Boys in the Cave. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure to have someone like you on our show because, you know, I've done a dig- big dive into the sort of content you put out, the interviews that you've done. And it's really interesting the sort of issues that you do cover. It's probably not as, you know, discussed within the community. And it, it it's a shame because, you know, um, as we were speaking offline, like, unfortunately, like, it is a norm where um, this sort of situations do happen within the Muslim community. But before I sort of dive into that um, side of um, what you deal with within the community, I know that you've actually studied overseas, you know, mashallah, seeking knowledge. And, you know, it's it's a real sort of, uh, it would be amazing to sort of share your stories and your experiences in terms of what you've encountered and, and studying overseas. I think uh, as Muslims, it's sort of something that we have in the back of the mind and a lot of us don't end up, seeking knowledge overseas but at the same time it's great to sort of um, get someone's experiences and share their um, stories when it comes to um, studying um, overseas so just I guess as a, as a broad question um, maybe from your own words like where did you study and what sort of prompted you um, to study overseas and seeking knowledge so I started when I was in college like alhamdulillah you know I grew up going to circles of knowledge um, and while I was in college I, I learned Arabic and studied with local teachers um, and then I continued full-time studies upon graduating, as you mentioned. And um, actually, my last semester of college, I took off a semester and went to Mauritania, to Tumarat. Um, and that was that was really a great experience to see the overseas, like, top caliber shiur. And that's something I really, that's a, an experience I would hope everyone can have that's serious about studying. Even if they don't study full-time or long-term. But just to know the caliber caliber of scholarship that's out there. Because, you know, a lot of times we'll call people sheikh and scholars, but reali- in reality, they've studied with real ulama, people who would be considered ulama in the Muslim world, you know. And they'll be proficient and are qualified to teach, inshallah, like what they're teaching. But when we say like alim and sheikh, we should have a ta'alim, like a veneration for that term. And that's what you'll see in the Muslim world. So whether it's Pakistan, Mauritania, um, Turkey, and other places, you know, South Africa, you will meet people who are actual like ulema by world standards. And that, that's something that's very important for people to see. MashaAllah. And in general, I think a lot of people underestimate the sort of scholarship that is um, prevalent in, in those sort of um, places. And unfortunately, would you say that a lot of our scholarship, a lot of our gems are sort of hidden there, but because of the fact that we're in the West, you know, we don't have as much of that scholarship um, in the West compared to what's in those um, sort of lands. Well, yeah, I mean, the Muslim world has been established in terms of, you know, Islamic studies and madrasas and obviously Oqaf, like the waqf, that that really helps as well. But you can't really compare somebody who grew up, you know, learning Arabic, for example, memorizing the Quran and then memorizing texts of grammar and fiqh to people who start studies later on in life you know just starting arabic later on in life for example so we again we have a good amount of teachers and people who are proficient in the deen and they should be respected for that but when we talk about again ulama like the big names that come to mind would be like a mufti taki usmani right um or a like a murabt al-hajj who was mentioned earlier and names like that you know, these are these are like real ulama who are authoritative in their fields, like Mufti Takusmani would be in in economics, and that's really the understanding I wish everybody could have about what a scholar is, what a sheikh is. And then you have many others who won't be as well known, but they teach in schools, like you know, scholars of hadith, 
And you know, unfortunately, we've lost uh, many of these top caliber scholars recently, but they are still alive in the Muslim world. It's interesting you brought up a point where, you know, in terms of our scholarship, because I've had friends that studied overseas and one thing that they have mentioned is that, you know, they might be however old, like 22 years old. And uh, in the classes, there's like, you know, 12 or 13 year olds sort of attending classes and they're thinking, what the heck's happening here? You know, like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, much older than these guys, but these guys are like much knowledgeable than me. But I guess on the, these, when you're in the sort of uh, Eastern countries and you have brought up around like Islam and there's the sort of institutions there and high caliber scholars there, it will like as a natural reaction there will be a uh, younger much younger people that are actually you know seeking knowledge at a much younger age compared to uh, most of us in the west uh, would you say that's like a sort of recurring theme at times i mean you have madrasas in the west as well and i didn't finish answering questions so, like i actually studied majority in the states and i had you know very good respectful teachers you know studied books of hadith as well and I mean, they would all tell you like they're real muhaddithin, they're overseas, but they're still proficient in being able to teach what they can. And there are efforts to establish madrasas and even start people younger. But really, when you talk about the high quality and the high caliber, that is in the Muslim world. And like, as I mentioned, even just visiting and having that frame of reference is really important. So people understand when we say scholar, we're talking about very high caliber um, people, um, people who are authoritative in their field. And not just, you know, what would be like a somebody vocationally trained. And I think those titles get mixed up a lot. You know, so you have like arbitrary titles oftentimes, like, like Sidi. Sidi is not even, I mean, I don't even know how that became a title. But like Ustad, Sheikh, Brother, you know, and oftentimes it's arbitrary. Okay, subhanAllah. And... Because you yourself, you uh, in your sort of bio, it mentions that, and you said it yourself, like you studied in Mauritania in the school of Marabat al Hajj, Rahimallah. Um, I wanted to ask just out of curiosity, have you actually met uh, Marabat al Hajj, Rahimallah? Yes, yes, Alhamdulillah, like many times over the years, uh, many times. Um, I, I would go mainly in the, spend my winters there um, from, from about 2009 to 2018, so four to three months, and I would go there. Um, and alhamdulillah, yeah, I got to spend time with, with Murat al Hajj and see him. He was not teaching at that time, um, but I would, you know, sit with him and study with the other teachers there, and mainly Murat had the main Sheikh Abdullah Ahmadna, and those were my main teachers in that uh, place, which is called Timrat. Subhanallah. And even with the sort of, I guess, um, a lot of our listeners might be sort of living in the West and experiencing life in the West. And I guess for yourself, you said, you know, you were studying and then you sort of went overseas to uh, seek knowledge. Would you maybe uh, walk us through the sort of experiences or the sort of um, situation it is living in somewhere like uh, Mauritania and studying there? Yeah, Mauritania is interesting. I mean, especially that school. Uh, it's in the mountains. Um, so there's there was no electricity or running water. So it was it was a very interesting experience, you know. So people live, for example, drink water from wells, uh, used a lot of flashlights, and you'd see students lighting fires before Fajr to review their Quran. And there's a real knowledge is very centered over there, you know. And the way people teach also is is beautiful. There's one on one classes. Students come and learn one on one. Sometimes, if two students are learning the same text, they'll come and study it together. And everybody gets their personal relationship with the teacher. Everybody is focused on their own studies. And really, the goal of the teachers is to make you an autonomous Muslim. There's nobody interested out of the teachers to make to start a cult of personality. They're not, they don't want followers. They teach you the deen and then they teach you to think for yourselves. And there are other elements there as well, which to me I, is really a proof as well that cults are not a natural occurrence in a group dynamic. Uh, there are elements which could prevent that, which is a strong sense of self. And you can see even the children have a very so strong sense of self over there. They're raised to be strong and autonomous and not to be pushovers. So you, you see very healthy dynamics in terms of teacher student students amongst one another. And it, it's a good place to study and to see that um, kind of traditional learning. And, and again, Morton is not the only place. There are many places like that. 
um, in the Muslim world, one could see this. But, you know, I, I really, the one-on-one -on -one studying is very beneficial. And it's a good way of studying. And that's a norm over there. And they emphasize memorization of texts as well. So they'll have books of fiqh, grammar, aqidah, and they'll have it in, po in poem, in verse. So people then memorize those. So it's easy for, for them to retain and recall easily. So it'll be like the skeleton and then they go to the teacher and the teacher gives them the commentary on those texts. Even in terms of, I guess, my other question would be, um, because you, you mentioned um, the teacher-student relationship, which I think is really beautiful. And sometimes, you know, living in, in the West and sort of studying, you know, the normal sort of secular um, knowledge, uh, you don't, like you do, I guess, you do build that relationship with the teacher, but it seems like a one, more one-on-one -on -one sort of um, relationship is is not there when it comes to, you know, um, in, in the classroom environment. And even in the classroom environment, what happens is, there's only one style of teaching or one style of uh, teaching students. And at times, for example, I've found that different students pick up concepts a bit slower compared to others. Um, some students get distracted uh, quicker, uh, quicker etc. So like it becomes difficult at times to, uh, you know, for, for the students to um, retain some of that knowledge. So how would you say like that, that sort of style is in comparison to in Mauritania would you say like the sort of uh, the the teacher is Masha you know because these are like um, very um, big scholars they are proficient in the sense of teaching and, and teaching skills and knowing what sort of student and what sort of style they need and they sort of accommodate um, according to that or is it sort of up to um, the student to figure out on the and on their own in terms of you know what sort of benefits them or what sort of learning style benefits them the benefits them the most well more genuine they have a set curriculum of the text you will do but you can also go and bring any book and they'll teach it but the teachers know their students they know where their students are and and also they'll get they'll do the students will review with one another if they're studying the same text which builds their knowledge as well um and there's a lot you can read about this in books on uh, adab of learning and advice on learning one of the be best ways to solidify knowledge and to gain knowledge is review with other students. So that's a really central ingredient um, or component in, in gaining knowledge. And one of the benefits of small classes is that you benefit from the questions of other students, and then you learn from one another in that way. So group classes, especially if they're small group classes, it, it can still be an intimate setting. And I've studied this way as well. Um, there, there is a benefit in it because you benefit from other questions. And as you mentioned, if some students are slower in understanding something and the teacher explains it even clearer, then you understand it even better. And in other sections, you might be the one who's uh, slower to understand it. And you have students who can help explain it and the teacher can help explain it. And ultimately, that's how knowledge is passed on. So there, there, there is benefits to both. I would say that, I mean, one-on-one -on -one is great and small, intimate groups the really where I think there's a loss is when they're big classes. And just like you'll hear in like uh, Western education, right? The teacher student ratio is important. So if you have like four or five, even eight students, that's pretty solid, you know, and there could be a benefit to that. Uh, and it could be more advantageous to one-on-one -on -one in many instances, especially if you don't have other students to review with, you know, one-on-one -on -one uh, classes. In terms of, I guess, even because it, it, what you've described sort of sounds like a collaborative um, effort in terms of learning. Would you say that sort of um, what is, is a good way to describe this um, the sort of learning uh, style in Montana as well? Yes, I think I think you'll find that everywhere. Um, so again, even if the classes are one on one, students studying the same text or or finding an advanced student to review with and read it a second time, that's important. And I should have mentioned this, but like, so if, for example, if you have a student reading a text let's say um, Akhtari, they'll read it on three different teachers and get three different commentaries on it and benefit from what three different teachers have to say. So it's not just one lesson with one teacher. They'll go to different teachers and read the same text and then, and then find other students to review it with. So repetition is really important. Mashallah. And yeah, the, the definitely like it seems like 
the more you sort of repeat and more go through the motions and go through um, the learning, even with different sort of teachers, I guess everyone sort of brings their own uh, insight in terms of uh, commentary uh, compared to another person. It's not going to be like the exact same thing. So I think it does seem like it, it's more interactive. You get different uh, sort of for, for the same content, you get different sort of thoughts from different um, scholars. And I think it, it it's definitely se- seems like a more dynamic way of learning compared to, I guess, what we um, experience um, in, in the West at times. Would you say that's that's the case as well? Yes, I would. I would. Alhamdulillah. And even, I guess, going back to uh, Marabat al-Hajj, in terms of like, I think a lot of us uh, hear about all these stories about you know the miraculous stuff um, that he uh, did, for example, or anything, any any sort of stories um, in regards to him. Uh, would you say like you have any uh, stories to share in regards to Marabu Tal Hajj specifically? So the most amazing thing anybody could do is have istiqama, uprightness in the Sharia. And people who knew him for eighty plus years said that he never he never committed a riba, he never backbit anybody. Um, very devotional into knowledge and worship, you know, um, not somebody who had any love of dunya. And, you know, his actions and his piety really spoke for itself. For me, what was really um, eye-opening to see was how he was always making thicker. So even between uh, bites of, of food, he would he would make dhikr and it was only when he was eating that he would stop because he was eating and then right after the bite he was back into making dhikr um, to the point where in his sleep actually he would recite Quran fluently um, and one of the nights I was actually um, I slept in the same tent as him and he recited Quran the whole night so I said to you know one of his grandchildren like, oh Murabi didn't really sleep this night huh and he said, he said, Danish, he was sleeping the whole night. And I said, and I said, oh, but he was reciting Quran so loud. And he was like, yeah, he can recite that fluently in his sleep. So I mean, I had heard it. I mean, him reciting Quran in his sleep before I knew he did it, but it was like very fluent Quran with energy. And then uh, something one of his students told me the last time I was there is that uh, when he would, when he was not really able to, um, walk to the masjid on his own and stand for even for prayer. Uh, in Ramadan, he, as he would need some help walking to the masjid. But when he would enter the masjid, he could like suddenly stand on his own. He would call the adhan, give the iqamah, pray isha, pray 20 rakat of tarawih. And they, they were describing as with the energy of a young person, like in his 20s. And then right after the salat, he would uh, need assistance again, um, walking back to his place. And they were describing that as like a karama, you know, that like when it was for Salat, he had the full energy of a young man. No, I just wanted to add um, um, that I mentioned that point of constantly making dhikr because I actually, when I when I heard some descriptions of a uh, Sahaba, like needing to put uh, rocks in their mouth to not make a dhikr while in the bathroom, um, I, I just thought that was kind of hyperbolic. And it was after seeing Murat al-Hajj that I, that I realized it wasn't hyperbole. Subhanallah. Yeah, like, because I guess I've always going to sort of link it back to our experiences in the West because that's, I guess, my sort of um, frame of reference. And it's just amazing to sort of hear these stories and hear these, um, share these uh, insights about someone as great as Murabat al Rahimallah, where we, because in terms of what you just mentioned about um, the eating and the food and the dhikr, like, it sort of uh, accentuates the idea of of the presence that he had whilst he was eating, like the presence of uh, remembering Allah whilst he's doing everything. I think like that's the sort of takeaway point. Like sometimes, um, even for myself, you know, it's like for like sometimes we forget to say sort of Bismillah, right? But I guess the symptom of that sometimes is that we don't have that pure presence in the moment and remembering Allah in every instance. So for me, that's like a that's like a reminder where it's like, oh. You know, I should be actually remembering Allah in that every instance, and that will just naturally mean that I'll say Bismillah before I eat, right? So I guess like Marble Hajj is like actually embodying that um, at every step, every moment, even like Subhanallah during his sleep. Um, would you say that that's the sort of case as well? Yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. And even uh, for example, it, because even with the sleep thing, like it's a bit 
<laughs> people would be confused like if he's like truly sleeping how's he reciting quran like is there a sort of explanation um on that front or it's just like because if you're sleeping you're sleeping you know <laughs> no so it's a bit confusing it's like how's he reciting quran whilst he's actually like sleeping you know what i mean yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to answer that really, except he did. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know some people would come and like they would, they would just see that some of his old students would come visit, you know, and say, you know, like there's an Arabic saying that every container spills what's in it, you know, or can only pours out what what's inside of it. So they would say Murabit, his whole life was Quran, all he, you know, his whole life was Quran, and uh, even when he sleeps, he recites Quran. Even like from my uh, s- the stories that I've heard as well in regards to Murab al Hajj, like one, uh, I think I was listening, I can't recall, but it was from like an interview of someone that actually also studied um, in, in his school where they said that, for example, he would be praying and it would be like the Kibbalah is one direction and then someone would actually come and turn, me, turn him in, in a different direction, sort of assuming that the Kibbalah is in that direction. But then Murab al sort of rep- responds back saying, you know, I actually see the Kaaba in front of me. That's why I'm praying this way. SubhanAllah. So have you heard this story by any chance? Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned that story because I, I asked actually one of the sheikhs in Timurat in the same village about that. Because I didn't, I didn't know. Like, I, my question was, would you really use cash over the calculations? You know, like that didn't seem uh, correct to me. You know, um, just based on what I, I knew at the time. And then I asked, and then and then his answer was, yes, that becomes something you can go by if it's within the scope of of uh, your outward calculations. So if it could be like a few degrees to the right or a few degrees to the left then you can use cash like that that vision as an aid but it has to fall within the scope of what um you could measure by outward means so for example if it was the complete completely behind you outside of the acceptable span of calculations then you would not be able to use that Subhanallah. But, can, but, yeah. but the story you mentioned is true is true yes so alhamdulillah and i guess for ourselves like it, it, it's like a reminder that these these sort of situations are possible within um, the the realm of um, uh, hu- humans, and in the sense that you know Allah sort of bestows these situations for um, a select few, and at the same time, it I guess for myself it becomes you know <laughs> back of my mind I'm like oh man I wish I could have that sort of experience that'd be pretty cool all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, I guess me wanting it is a sign that. It's it's not, it's probably not it's not going to happen. But in the sense that it's only bestowed for those like who don't sort of want it. Like I was even speaking to uh, a friend, and he was telling me a story about you know the olia of the past, where for example they were tested with uh, situations like they'll do wudu, and then instead the wudu the water would actually turn into gold, and then it's sort of a test for them in terms of how do they deal with it. Because for me, if I had that sort of gold in front of me as i'm doing will do i'll be like oh yeah it's gonna go sell it because i'm gonna make some big money but at the same time <laughs> <laughs> these these subhanallah like the maqam of these uh you know, scholars and 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 shuyuk uh are so high that they actually the only way that allah can sort of test them i guess it's a testing of itself is that to do these sort of things because it tests your ego right like if you have this sort of experience or um this sort of um situation uh it becomes a test for those uh, for those people in in some sense. So uh, it's it's actually like an, an interesting sort of dynamic when it comes to um, people being tested as well. Yeah, that, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, one of the things also that's really emphasized in Mauritania, and and they'll just have a good understanding of it that these unveilings and breakings of the norm, you know, breaking of the norm like al Ada or Karama, they're not really what you measure somebody by. And it's not really a higher sign of somebody's wilaya as well, you know. So like Allah says in the Quran, وَيَسَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحِ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُتِتُ مِنْ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا That, you know, they ask you concerning the soul, say the soul is from the fear of my Lord, and you've only been given a little bit of knowledge concerning it. Because, you know, there's Buddhists and Hindus and who can perform these type of miracles, walking on water, um, telling you what your thoughts are, things of that nature. That's not actually the sign of wilai or piety. And that's why I mentioned like the first thing about Murat al-Hajj, it's istiqamah. It's being firm on the sharia. 
because these other breakings of the norm, Allah gives it to the people he loves and doesn't love. But firm and uprightness, the ability to follow the sunnah, that's only for the people Allah loves. Something uh, Murabit Haddamin would say after we'd have these sort of discussions many times was he recited these lines of poetry. That if you see a man walking, uh, sorry, if you see a man flying or walking on water and he doesn't stop at the limits of the sharia, then he's somebody who's been led astray or an innovator. Because these type of breakings of the norm and training this soul to see unveilings and even performing breakings of the norm, that's something a non-Muslim could do. It's something a mushrik could do. And one way to have these unveilings is to starve yourself, you know, is to, is to not eat a lot. And this is something that's talked about in books of the soul. And it's a way people are led astray as well, you know, because they'll think they have some muqam based on spiritual experience. And it's one of the strongest ways people become deluded. And the whole idea of a sheikh is someone who can keep you grounded while you're having these experiences. And if it's the byproduct of your ibadah and zuhud, reading the Quran, that can be a good thing, but it's not an indication of where somebody is. And Murabit Ahmad Fal, who recently passed away, I wrote, I wrote an article on him. Um, this is something like, I would bring a lot of these type of questions to him. And he would, he would really emphasize that a wali who has a karama is not does not have a higher maqam than somebody than a wali who does not have a karam. Like that's just totally not the standard. So these things, if they're byproducts of ibadah, they can, they're good, but they're not a measure and they're not something that should be the aim really. Um, and again, you know, the Dajjal is going to have a lot of breakings of the norm and he's going to be able to perform uh, things which will seem like more jizas to people, you know. But really, it's the uprightness on the Sharia, and that's that's the only measure there is for somebody. I think in these sort of discussions, it for me, it's almost like an iman busa because um, Islam is about you know, following the Sharia. At the end of the day, it's not going off um, people's. Um, situations or experiences or feelings or any of that sort like even um even uh, sort of sex within islam that's uh, some people call themselves like the mahdi for example without getting into specifics that occurred because of this uh, what you just described in terms of they had this experience in allah and they were like deluded and allah sort of let them astray and then people followed them as well in that situation you know um subhanallah and that sort of become in terms of what you just described with your, um, from your teachers and what they said about karama and all that sort of stuff it's important to understand i guess as muslims that it's about following the sharia at the end of the day it's not following your sort of win because with experiences it might if you don't follow the sharia it could just become you know a whole concept of just following the whims and desires and how you experience and that could even potentially um because even your specialty when it comes to you know spiritual abuse and um have encountering those sort of situations that could actually breed almost that sort of situation where they have that advantage and sort of let, lead other people astray for their own sort of gain. So I guess um, I, I remember even uh, there would be stories about certain um, figures of, of, in our Muslim um, sort of history or in the past where they would actually specifically get the most difficult sort of rulings within the Sharia and try to follow that um, to the T to sort of um, could be a sort of um, breaking of the nafs um, situation where they really want to be um, ardent on the, on the Sharia and try to follow it to the T um, in a way to like test themselves and in order to be um, standing upright and be disciplined and um, following you know God's sort of way. So I guess at the end of the day, it's about all of us Going back to following the Sharia and clearly would have been um, emphasized uh, during your sort of um, studies in, in Mauritania and understanding that on a much uh, deeper level in that sense. Yeah, and as you mentioned about the Mahdi, I mean, teachers that I know in America and friends that I have, many of them know a handful of people without exaggeration who made a lot of zikr, got very much into these sort of practices and went crazy started thinking they're the Mahdi um, some start thinking they're the Qutub and they just lose it because they have really intense experiences so it's not to deny their experiences or say they're lying it's just to acknowledge first of all that this is not even the unique property of the 
of the Muslims, you know. And sometimes when people are too much into this, it gives way to like um, beliefs of kufr, like perennialism, where you'll call it the transcendent truth of spiritual experience, because you're you're giving experience a status that it just doesn't deserve. And one of the things about the Prophet, right, like Prophets, alayhim salam, is their visions, their me- uh, revelation and what they see from the unseen is is sound. You don't have to believe anybody else in what they say. You know, it could be even hallucinations for other people. We just don't know. People who do, like in years of Dawr Hadith, for example, it's very common that they see the Prophet some in dreams because they're so um, engrossed in Hadith. That's what they're studying. So it becomes the type of dream that's from your own nafs. Not, and I don't mean nafs in a negative way, but I mean from what your mind is preoccupied with because they're so engaged in Hadith. And uh, like another thing about Hadamin and Mortania mentioned was that that karamat, they're for the low level of awliya, oftentimes. It's to make them firm in their deen because they need it. But like the sta- statement of Sayyidina Ali, that if the veil were lifted, it wouldn't increase me in faith one bit. Because if somebody believes in the angels, they don't need to see an angel. It's enough that the Prophet some told us there's angels. What's what's left? Why does it matter if you see it or not? The Prophet is is truthful in what he came with and what he delivered. And he said there are angels. So there's no need to see it. It's not a confirmation. It's as good as seeing it. And that's that's the real yaqeen that we should strive for. SubhanAllah, thank you for that um, great reminder as well and uh, what we should actually be um, striving for because sometimes we lose um, sight of that at times. And even with the concept of like you mentioned earlier, Dhikr and having some people having these experiences, I think it's just a, um, just a reminder as well like how powerful um, the Quran and, and Dhikr can be because if you do like... Um, you do it to an extent where it's like intense and doing it all the time. There is a sort of power in, I don't know how if power is the correct term yeah. within this um, sort of context, but there's that power attached to it where it can create those um, experiences and those uh, spiritual experiences. And that could be t- testing of itself. And it's about, as you mentioned earlier, going back to the Sharia, making sure that the person is following the Sharia because you can be led astray. And it's about um, making sure that we aren't. We are always, you know, being disciplined and following the Sharia to the T. And always, it's always a reminder for ourselves to, you know, stick to that rather than not be lost in those sort of um, experiences or just this purely spiritual side and focusing on that. It's about bringing the sort of discipline and the Sharia within that as well. Right, and you know, one of my, I've, I have friends who've actually become very deluded through spiritual experience as well, you know, and they make these type of claims, really outrageous claims. My dad told me in Pakistan, you would have like mushrikeen and Muslims go together to places like in different forests. And, you know, the mushrik would make his own zikr um, to strengthen himself spiritually. And the Muslim who's, you know, into the self would make his um, some azkar you'd make into water because they're like have a hot effect, things of that nature, you know. And it's the soul is like a muscle, like the body. So if you work it out, there's ways to work it out and make it stronger. So Hindus, Christians, Buddhists, they can work their soul and make it very strong as well. But that does not give them a higher muqam with Allah. That's only in the Sharia. And this just can't be emphasized enough. So with Murabit Ahmad Fal, like I, I didn't mention in the article like any kashf of his, although there were many instances where I saw that, you know, many instances. But the reason is that's just not the measure. And to be honest with you, I've seen more of that from charlatans than from pious people. SubhanAllah. That's a really good um, insight because I think it's interesting, like especially in the West and how I hear about situations and people are uh, taking drugs or hallucinating and perhaps even having sort of um, experiences, they sort, they put more weight into that, if that makes sense. And the whole concept of following a, a religion to the T or, you know, following the Sharia, it's sort of missed at times. So it's about re- reorienting and focusing on the, on the true um, objective when it comes to living um, on this earth and living in the dunya is to follow the Sharia to the T and not be swayed by these sort of experiences and spiritual experiences. And that's why in these groups, you have so much 
confusion and people being taken advantage of because one, there's a lot of escapism as well. People are just bored with the world, especially how secular and non-spiritual the world can be. And anything that's spiritual, they'll just equate with in accordance with God because it's spiritual. And they, they make that connection on their own. And it can be very difficult to talk to people, talk people out of that because they'll just believe they're personally guided and they won't really care what the, what the Sharia actually has to say about this because they'll just have such strong spiritual experiences, you know. So in kind of the coaching and working with people in these abusive situations or have been in, in like these kind of cults, one of the points to really drill in is spiritual experience is not the measure, you know. And that's, that's, that can be hard for people who've had a very intense spiritual experiences. But again, that's not for the Muslims. And, and as you mentioned, I mean, now there's people taking um, like DMT and, and different kind of drugs for these uh, type of experiences as well. Yeah, I find especially um, with the people that are in, like living in the West and the sort of discussions that happen as well with um, friends that I've um, grow, grown up with, uh, especially going to like a sort of, I didn't go to like a Muslim school and a non, so I went to like a, um, any public sort of school and that's the sort of conversation becomes about chasing that high or chasing that sort of um, feeling and, and that experience. Like I know like people may take um, certain drugs while they're at, and I'm partying and they talk about I've my friends actually told me I'm um, to uh, I'll share like a, a story where my friends like look if you put these sort of glasses on whilst you're in a um, EDM sort of a house music sort of um, event and you're on uh, I think you said cocaine or something something to that effect or ecstasy you know this crazy spiritual experience happens and you know and at the end of the day, you know, that I'm just like, okay, cool. But it's it's all about chasing that. And for me, uh, from a personal experience, I know the sort of experience I have when I'm praying, for example. So it's not like I need to chase this because I already feel that um, following the Sharia and what Allah has sort of um, told me to do, I know that there will be um, that quote-unquote ex- uh, uh, spiritual experience in that. But it's interesting because for them, it's very it's a quick way to do it. It's like, oh, you just take this and go to this event and you can have that experience. Whereas sometimes, like even with prayer, it took like a good two, three years, like deep, um, like praying consistently where you have that experience um, eventually, right? But at the end of the day, Asherah doesn't tell us to sort of chase that experience, right? It just tells us to follow the Asherah because Allah commanded it. And, you know, that's, almost a way to gain salvation in, in the hereafter because we want to um, follow Allah's way to the T um, as much as we can in, in this dunya as well. Right, and that itself is an act of ribadah to just be consistent despite not always feeling that presence, that khushu, and continuing in that. And that's really worshipping Allah because Allah deserves to be worshipped, not for anything, any secondary reasons. And, you know, when those moments of sweetness come, when that khushu comes, those are beautiful things and they're gifts um, and good dreams. They're all gifts. And I believe it's the statement of Imam Malik, be happy, but don't become deluded. Um, and, you know, and really the point is to continue regardless and to be true Arbidin worshippers and servants of Allah who do worship Allah because Allah deserves to be worshipped. For sure, and I guess as well, it's just having that patience as well, and inshallah that you know, that time will come. Um, do also ask you a question. It's not really you don't like have to uh, the way I'm because you mentioned uh, sort of experience like other faiths and their experience when it comes to um, spiritual experiences, right? Like the Hindu or whoever that they also these figures or. Um, yeah, leaders or figures within, for example, the Hindu religion, they'll have these, um, let's call their version of sheikhs who have uh, spiritual experiences. And it's like at times, I guess, as a Muslim or other faith group, when they're looking at that, they see that as a sort of, um, uh, what do you call it, criteria for truth? Like, okay, look, you know, they're having this spiritual experience. Is there really um, a sharia needed? Because look, you know, he must be close. We've got like, even in maybe in the Hindu religion, there's their, they have their own Sharia, so it's like, okay, they're following their own rules and regulation. And it sort of feeds into the sort of perennialist um, way of thinking where they say that, okay, look, a Muslim um, figure, a Muslim sheikh can have the same spiritual experience and the Hindu guy is having this sort of um, spiritual experience. He's following his own rules. Um, Muslims are following 
their own rules so you know what's the difference at the end of the day you know they're all trying to strive to get to god so they'll have their own salvation their own way you know may allah forgive them in in the sort of uh things that they may uh not not be correct in some of our least you know they're trying and etc etc but they're very much you know they look like pious people and understand people and um are worshippers of god what would your sort of response be to that line of thinking um if a muslim was was to say that i think because especially in this day and age uh people may have that sort of thoughts in in general as well this reminds me of a book i read an autobiography of a yogi i I can't really pronounce the name of the author. It's something like Paramahansa. And in that, it's very interesting because he essentially mentions a quote that's in line with Adabul Karama, Hil Istakama, that the greatest miracle is uprightness. And he talks, spoke about young yogis who are impressed by their ability to do, perform these miracles, but they don't like really have uprightness in their faith. Um, and they become deluded by their own um, spiritual abilities and he mentioned stories all kinds of stories of saints um, like hindu saints who could perform different kinds of miracles and they would go to their own holy places just like we have stories of people um, being able to go to the Me- going to the kaaba miraculously so you have a lot of parallels and it just goes back to this idea of what's the criterion it's not the soul because this this mastery of the soul and ability ability to break the norms i mean you will see it in sorcerers You'll see it in in uh, Hindus, in polytheists, in Muslims. Uh, the Christian tradition has many, you know. And also, I mean, there was the, I forget his name, somebody in the time of the Prophet that people thought was the Dajjal. He was a, he had Kesh of Sahaba. He was able to tell them certain things about their own selves, you know. So these, these aren't things that we're going to, we, it's not our criterion, and we really need to be firm on that. And part of that is just being very in touch with our religion. And and the firmness is that no matter how intense the spiritual experiences are, we have our sharia and that's what that's what everything else is under. And, re- and the experience has to be relegated by the sharia, period. And again, one of the big problems is that the, sh- the sheikhs that people want to go to for guidance in these issues are themselves deluded. It's really very problematic and i believe there's a story of saint omar who saw a christian very um, a monk very devotional very pious and he cried and he said you know this person has prohibited himself from every enjoyment in this world and he'll be prohibited in the next world too from the enjoyment at the end of the day you know the the prophet some he came with the final revelation his religion, Islam, is the only religion for salvation. And it's about believing in Allah, the prophets, the angels, the ar- our articles of faith, and the Prophet Islam coming with the final revelation. And he abrogates all other religions. And that's that's the key to Jannah. That's the key to salvation. And yes, people can be good people, but their religion is not Haq. And that's a foundational belief of ours. MashaAllah, you articulated that very beautifully because I guess to uh, you can maybe answer this where like I guess uh, you just articulate beautifully in terms of articles of faith, etc. I guess it just kind of goes back to understanding like the scripture, what Rasulullah came with because and understanding that to to the T because, you know, we know um, in our Quran, you know, it's miraculous. Uh, the language and um, what it says about, you know, this life and the hereafter um no no contradiction in in sort of the way it's articulated um the scripture in of itself whereas i guess if you compare it to perhaps other religions there's it's not clear there's you know it's it's not preserved and all that sort of stuff so even the theology you know you have multiple gods it's like you know god like allah has a sort of right in terms of you know not being uh associated with uh, partners uh, alongside him and that's why it's like shirk and you know it's it's pretty much the biggest thing you can do in that sense so it's about being cognizant and aware of the theology being aware of the rights allah has over you and really giving you know time and energy into understanding those um specifics because at the end of the day 
um, as humans, you know, we've given, we've been given uh, speech, we've been given sight, we've been given those things, and uh, you know, a sort of a brain as well, in you know, order to understand, read, seek knowledge, etc., and unpack these um, these uh, these truths um, in the sense of scripture. But I guess, uh, as we talked, you know, uh, just just now in terms of spiritual experiences, if it just only is solely based on that, you know, everyone can do it and that's not really a, a criterion for truth so would you say like it it just goes back to using your your brain and you know your sort of blessings that god has given you in order to understand theology in order to understand these um scriptures and and using and god and sticking to that right so one also we have to understand that the that the the arabs they were aware of like soothsayers like Kohan, right? They had access to the ghayb. People used jinn at the time. So like Allah says in the Quran that about the Prophet وسلم, that the Prophet وسلم, he's not somebody who like withholds from the or somebody who's you know like doubted or untrusted in matters of the unseen. So everything he says is perfect from the unseen. He's a prophet. But other people, when we talk about experiences, I mean, like I said earlier, we don't really know what they're experiencing. It's not something that's factual or something that's like qatari at all. They could be hallucinations, right? A prophet, it's absolute. So this understanding that, that you know, the prophets are the ones, they're unseen, their messages from the unseen, that's what's trusted completely. And Allah says also about like the Quran, that these are not the words of a poet. And then, and then, and then um, the next ayah, wala bi kahin, nor is it the words of a soothsayer. Again, people who use jinn and got messages from the unseen, and these are things that the Arabs were familiar with. But a prophet is absolute; it's qatri, it's clear what he what he's bringing. So again, these spiritual experiences, like it's it has to be in line with the Sharia and with what Allah brought. And to your point, like, as you were mentioning, yes, we have to be grounded in our own deen and knowing what what the Messenger وسلم, brought and what all the prophets have brought and what is the message of Allah to his creation. And that's really all we have. And that, that's the only thing we could really believe in and the only standard we could go by. Otherwise, we're making up our own our own beliefs. Right, and then the prophet, like Allah told the prophet, tells the prophet to say, "Qul ma kuntu bid'ah min al-rusul," say that I'm not an innovation from the messengers. These people, the Ahl Kitab, they they know who the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. They knew the concept of a prophet. Alladhi nata inhum al-kitab yarif yarifuna hu kama yarifuna abnaahum. The ones that we've given the book, they know him like they know their own children, right? From his description of knowing what a prophet actually is. Subhanallah, thank you for sort of articulating that beautifully where it's it's always just a reminder to go back to our tradition, go back to the Shia and, and follow that as well because, um, yeah, as we've probably uh, mentioned a lot of times where it's not, you know, spiritual, as you beautifully just mentioned now as well with the spiritual experiences and that's not like objective um, criteria where even like maybe you can kind of correct me if I'm wrong about this where every, you know, passages in the Quran it talks about Allah commanding you know the best of you are those who for example you know stand up at night um, praying tahajjud um, in those sort of situations it's not like Allah is saying you know commanding you to chase that sort of spiritual experience in order for you to pray tahajjud because a lot of people may have that in the back of their mind where it's like okay look I know the sort of experiences I've had when I you know I don't, for example pray tahajjud that's the reason why I'm going to sort of pray that but actually it's about doing the act for the sake of Allah it's not necessarily kind of mixing it with the spiritual experience right the spiritual experience sort of happens organically in that situation so I guess my my point and maybe I'm wrong maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong where it's like Allah commands us to do actions for the sake of him and it's almost articulated uh, consistently throughout the Quran in regards to doing specific like fasting all this stuff it's not because um, even in fasting if your mind like for me <laughs> when uh, you know the intermittent fasting is like a big thing now 
and i i do do it time to time and i guess for me it's like oh it keeps my you know brain clear you know it keeps my focus up high and those become sort of the reasons for why i do it where it's whereas sometimes you know it's sort of sort of missing the point from the islamic perspective it's like we should be doing these acts purely for the sake of allah because allah wants us to and at the same time we get rewarded for as well so it's like benefit for ourselves so it's sort of a different way of uh like i guess non-religious people would do these acts for a self-serving reason if that makes sense whereas for us it's always been going back to doing x thing because for the sake of allah if that makes sense right and i don't want to be too harsh about this either i mean i mean so first in the quran i mean allah praises different people who have different qualities um but yeah also i mean look there are hadith about halawatul iman right tasting the sweetness of faith like one mentions the three qualities that one loves Allah and his messenger more than anything else like Allah and his messenger more beloved than anything else that that you know he has someone with whom he loves or someone he loves uh, only for the sake of Allah and and someone hates to go back to kufr like they like they hate to be thrown into the fire another another hadith about that would be like for somebody who about the lustful glance being a poisoned arrow from shaitan and that whoever controls his his glance Allah replaces it with a sakina with a sweetness so i i asked one of my teachers this once that is it a type of you know bad intention to want um sweetness and and spiritual experience and the answer was no it's it's actually it can be noble if it's understood properly because it's still in line with being a better worshiper and having khushu and presence. So I don't want to be too harsh about this either. But a more pure intention would be to worship not uh, for any of those things. And again, they're all, they'll oftentimes be byproducts of proper worship. And it's important to do things like be in a state of wudu, um, try to be in a state of wudu throughout the day, make a vicar and, and really controlling the eyes and the ears. So, you know, devices don't really help at all in those in those areas. But it's to not feel let down or that Allah doesn't love you and you're not connected because a person's not experiencing those type of things. Because that's not the criterion for being close and having a high rank with Allah. And the Hajjud, yeah, I mean that's that's really a place where where intimacy with Allah is built, you know, and personal relationships established. And, you know, some scholars have mentioned it's where Wilai is handed out um, at the Hajjid time. It's doing those extracts of worship, you know, um, and the Hajjid's a great time for forgiveness and for making dua and to worship where, where others will be sleeping. So these aren't bad intentions if they're understood properly and a person, you know, doesn't go to extremes with it. Definitely, Well, Thank you for articulating that beautifully. Um, I think yeah, maybe I'll yeah, I was definitely a bit too harsh in that sense. But I guess uh, at the end of the day, it's about striving it, striving to do our best. Um, you know, respective or irrespective of in terms of having those sort of spiritual experiences in the process. But at the same time, as long as you know you're trying to you know get closer to Allah and do those extra good deeds and trying to do our best in terms of the uh in regards to the here and now and also uh worshiping allah um as well so i think it's important to always go back to and i think that's the theme of what we've just discussed is always just kind of going back to that and not purely relying on solely you know spiritual experiences as well i wanted to slightly take a shift in terms of uh the sort of discussions we've been having and it is so it is connected to what we've been discuss, discussing anyway because uh, for example you mentioned uh with spiritual experiences a lot of people actually take that as a sort of um criteria in terms of following them whereas they could be misguided and that's not necessarily having a spiritual experience and doing um certain miracles is not like a, a criteria if anything because we know that the will do miracles etc um, at the same time people use that if they claim to have some spiritual experiences or etc as a form of um doing abuse and sort of taking advantage of of people and i think it manifests in different ways um, but that's just one way as well but um, with your work that you've done within the community it seems like you've dealt with um 
situations of abuse um, within the Muslim community. So maybe could, if you could just sort of describe the work that you do um, in the Muslim community in regards to um, different types of abuse that you have to handle in terms of um, victims in that situation. One issue you'll have is people will go on Hajj or Umrah or the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid in Medina and then complain they didn't feel anything. And that's really one of those cases where there's too much importance given to feelings because you're in the Kaab, you're in uh, the Haram, you're in the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid, you're in Medina. And we should just recognize the beauty, give praise, and then that'll, that should itself put you in a, in a good state to just see the blessings around you. And if a person doesn't feel something in the haram, they might again feel like there's something very wrong with them. And that that's where it just becomes, it, it just works against you and will make you sad because you were expecting something and you didn't get it. But really the point is that you're there. You know, it'll turn something beautiful and positive into something negative because you'll feel maybe God's mad at you or you're just not good enough or you're not spiritual enough. And that's that's really sad when that happens. SubhanAllah, you actually bring a very, very good point because it's interesting. Uh, so I done we did an episode a while back with uh, my good friend Malik from Izan Avenue with uh, Muhammad Ishaq. Um, people can check that out, um, that episode, where he actually recounts exactly what he just mentioned in terms of he went to, I think, Hajj or Umrah, and he said that he didn't have like an experience or a sort of feeling when he was there. And so he went back to his place and he, he was thinking, oh, I have a dead heart and et cetera. And he was feeling bad. It's almost like you're, you're guilting yourself in that situation where you're forcing yourself to have a situation. It's not happening. And you just think, oh, you know, I'm a bad worship or whatever. And subhanAllah, what he said was he actually just flicked open a, a, a page from, I think, for the exact book, I think it was Michael Sugic's book. And he mentioned that he just flicked to a random page and subhanAllah, the page was like, you know, um, we don't we don't worship for feelings or something to that effect. Like Allah doesn't, you know, uh, I forgot the exact quote, but something to the effect of we don't do it for just for feelings. You, you get what I mean? So it's just, and then he was just like subhanAllah blown away. And I think it, it's exactly ties into what you were just mentioning that it's not, expecting you know it's when we do hajj or do umrah for example we shouldn't be guilting ourselves into uh having those feelings and if we don't have it we feel bad about it um i don't think that's the objective at the end of the, at the, end of the day it's more about if you don't have it if you have it, it's great if you don't have it you know just um ponder about the blessings you know try to engage in 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 you know dhikr and prayer and all that and extra good deeds and you'll you know inshallah you'll be rewarded anyway at the end of the day because that's the that's the main objective right we want to um please allah exactly yeah and you know there's stories of non-muslims seeing prophet some in his dreams you know and a non-muslim obviously does not you know the, uh, the worst muslim has a higher muqam you know because they're muslim and the non-muslim would have the dream of the prophet and sometimes you have Muslims who are sinners and not upright having dreams. There's a maybe a special inaya there for the Muslim or for whatever reason. And we can't put it on principles in a way of of the experience, the dreams, making anyone a better Muslim or a better person. Because again, that just we're making up our own criterion. SubhanAllah, yeah. And I guess with when it comes to people, it's always uh, difficult to compare oneself with others because I don't know someone as you, as you just mentioned anyone can have a dream of uh, Rasulullah or something because non-Muslims may have had it as well and you know you can't just kind of judge based off that because everyone has their own journey and only Allah knows about the about everything about a person right and we only have a, a small portion of what that person is, is experiencing so it's sort of judging base of you know if you're kind of making comparisons oh that guy's having spiritual experience why am i not having it etc and sort of making yourself feel bad about it in the process it's not gonna really get anywhere you know everyone has their own journey at the end of the day and it's always important to sort of um you know have patience with it you know try your best when it comes to um worshiping allah and doing the best you can as well and you know what else happens you just reminded me like when people do ziyarat to salihin like visiting righteous um, Muslims visiting scholars, Oliya, they'll sometimes grade somebody's maqam based on how they felt around them. And it's just an incredibly egocentric way of ranking people, you know. Not that we should even be ranking people because only Allah knows 
but they'll they'll literally say this person is a greater wali because I felt this around him and with this person I didn't feel anything. So their feelings become the standard for some other person's piety. It's just ridiculous. Um, one time I visited this um, person who was, you know, recognized and accepted widely as one of the awliya and really known for his open cash. And it was a dark night. My friend tried to shake his hand like an extra time after already we were meeting and sitting with him. And, and uh, the sheikh didn't uh, shake his hand, but he also didn't see his hand. And I knew he didn't see his hand. But then my friend got very sad thinking that, oh, he saw my sins and didn't shake my hand. And that, you know, that kind of thinking really bothers me. So I, I, I went back and I told him, like, look, and I didn't say look, but you know, I just said nicely, you know, this is what my friend thought had happened. Um, can you please tell him that that's not what happened? And then he just starts saying, subhanAllah, like, I don't have any kind of takabur, like arrogance over the sunnah of the messenger of Allah. He's like, I would never do that. He kept saying like, wallahi, it's a dark night. I didn't see it. And he was saying like, wallahi, it's a dark night. I didn't see his hand. And then I called him back in and then like, you know, they, they talked and, or he told him that it was a dark night and he didn't see his hand and he would never do something like that. But when you go in with these kind of ideas, sometimes you read it into the scenario, what's not really there. Subhanallah, like that, that story is very interesting as well, where I guess with uh, your friend, uh, that's sort of like with my uh, studies in, in psychology, there's a certain type of um, personality where they'll tend to think, 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 and maybe at times overthink situations. So when mm -hmm. something happens, it's like, oh, you know, this happened because of that or this person, uh, you know, did this because, you know, they think this of me. So I guess it's just a reminder that, you know, those sort of thoughts or those sort of situations we have as human beings that may be natural at times. Um, it's important that we should be aware of those um, sort of, uh, I don't know what to call like biases or natural inclinations as human beings and not use that to sort of judge others. Because at the end of the day, like, you know, we should be um, aware of ourselves and how we react to situations. So it's, it's really important that you brought up that um, example. It gives that idea that, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's beautiful how you just mentioned with, um, I think it was your teacher, right? That, you know, they wouldn't do that, you know, when it comes to um, the, the Sharia, because that's not, you know, not shaking someone's hand is obvious. It's not like something that is encouraged remotely, you know, within the sort of tradition. So I guess it, on a different point as well, like the ego is so, uh, when you start to understand um, how. Uh, the, the ego manifests in such subtle ways in, in such situations. Um, not, not in regards to the example you gave, but what you were talking about earlier in terms of, for example, this person and how they're grading uh, maqam of, of certain people and scholars around them based on how they feel. It's like sometimes when you self-reflect, it's like showing that, okay, sometimes you think, oh, wow, like my ego is so so deep and manifesting in such a subconscious level. I need to try my best to eradicate it like sometimes like even f uh, you know stuff for like sometimes you know i for example i know someone might be you know not into the dean as much etc and then there's that sudden like thought that just kind of pops in like oh you're better than them or something to that effect and you're just like oh man like you know i shouldn't be thinking that i know like thoughts on a, uh, don't define you so many shaitan putting those thoughts etc but the point is in in different ways it manifests so deep um within the subconscious at times where it's like you need you know it's it's the process of a human being right like we just have to try to do our best to not uh you know work work on purifying the heart at the end of the day because you know there's a famous uh, i think it was hadith where it's like you know allah when uh admit someone with a sort of was a grain of um even a grain's worth of of ego in, into sort of um jannah or oh, i'm butchering that for sure but um yeah <laughs> that sort of situation you know also it's the mindset that people develop a lot of times from these more like the sophie inclined circles where there's just like this reading into people like uh just on a topic of seeing sins right like oh if this person looked at me strange or didn't meet me properly he sees my sins you know and they just think they're like perpetually bad people when they're not even like really doing bad things 
And then you can just imagine if people have this type of neurosis, they're just so easy to manipulate, you know, or, or like just create situations where they are just not respected because of what's going on in themselves, you know? And th this type of mindset of like the righteous people, they, they see your sins and then they just make this club of only shaking hands with pious people and being mean to people who aren't pious. Like that's just not the deen. And, and I don't understand why you would even want to be around people if that's how you truly view them, you know? And, and, and there's also a lot of egocentricity in the, in the way people learn in some of these circles, right? So like they'll take events from the Sira and think and apply all that to themselves as if they're just somebody who's a great person waiting to manifest. So if they're down, if they're experiencing some hardship, they'll say, oh, this is like my life, which can be really problematic. You know, I mean, we're supposed to relate to the Sira and the Prophet of course, right? But the Prophet was guaranteed victory. He was ma'asum, in, in, in the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa So our lives in that way, we can't just view everything as if this is my part in the prophetic journey. There's, there's a lot of arrogance in that. So you, you'll see a lot of times when groups split up, for example, like they'll just take it to the closest analogy they have from the Prophet's life. Like, oh, this is like the battle of the, of the Jama, like between Sayyidina Aisha and Ali, you know, two great people. And they're just like, they have a disagreement, for example. And, and I think it's just really problematic when people will relate everything in their life to something that happened to the Prophet's life as if, they have this manifest victory at the end of all of it when there's not even a guarantee for husnul khatimah you know may allah give us all husnul khatimah mm -hmm. just to add as well um, to what you just mentioned i don't know if it's it is kind of connected because i was reading an article a while ago in terms of i think from memory it's called spiritual narcissism where for example not even from the religious standpoint but uh, from from let's quote quote unquote like secular way of looking at um, spirituality or even how people you know for example get up in the morning do um, yoga or do those um, sort of uh, meditation and they have that presence in mind they're aware of their um, instincts and situations etc how their body reacts and they have that sort of self awareness right and they have these uh, skills or these uh, tools um, in terms of um, uh, having that sort of mastery of the self and so what this article was discussing is that sometimes and a lot of the case it's like because you're able to do that it breeds a narcissism where you automatically think you're better than people around you because you're able to um, do this so it sort of manifests uh, weirdly in different ways and it's really beautiful how you know the islamic tradition it's important about uh it, it can't it, it consistently talks about and our sheikhs talk about this as well you know ego and and uh, really eradicating it um to the best of our ability so that's also a really interesting um discussion point in terms of um spiritual narcissism right and 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 this is what i was saying it's spiritual narcissism because people will are trained to interpret life and world events as happening for them in particular, all to show their greatness. And, and that's what I mean by it's not a healthy relating to the seer. It's a very egocentric way, as if all this happens just for me and for people to see how great I will be. <laughs> you, know, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That definitely um, makes sense. Like, mashallah, with, with the insights that you've brought, I think uh, a good sort of discussion is or we haven't really talked about historicas where we talk it because we've discussed you know spiritual experiences all that sort of stuff and um breaking the ego and how we should follow the sharia etc i think uh at times I, from to best of my knowledge like i'm not like involved with any tariqa from you know sort of secondhand sources in that sense people who have actually engaged in tariqas and sort of go through that system it seems like it's a good system or institution i don't know what to call it where it actually perfects um, or tries to um, solidify, you know, your aspects of, for example, um, Quran recitation, making it a, a consistent thing, or even trying to um, help uh, break the nafs in many ways. But I know there's different um, 
tarikas that do different things in different ways and even the approach may be different um i just wanted to ask like just out of curiosity like what's your um experiences been in terms of tarikas and maybe uh, for the listeners also would you be able to give sort of a definition to what it is so it's important to understand that the sawuf existed before tarikas came around so what the prophet taught um reaching ihsan which is to worship Allah as if you see him. And if you don't see him, then know that he sees you. That's called Maqam al-Ihsan. And that's essentially what Tasawuf is supposed to be, the process of attaining that. Tazkiyah, purifying, purification of the heart, purifying your soul. So that's that's what's meant by Tasawuf. Um, attaining Sudqut Tawajjah ilallah, that sincere in in inward directedness towards Allah. So that is something that has obviously was around the time of the Prophet and continued. People who would pray extra, eat less, learn knowledge, practice it, worship, uh, make toba right away, controlling you know their eyes, tongues, uh, ears from sin, and that, that that's the whole idea, ilm and amal, like learning and practicing that amal, avoiding sin and being quick to repent. I mean, that's really the sof. And then there are extra acts that people could do as long as they're halal that they find spiritually beneficial, and that's called tajriba. As long as it doesn't contradict the Quran or the Sunnah, then it, then a person can do those things. So you'll have certain people who would add practices like let's say, saying subhanAllah a thousand times after Asr. There's nothing prohibited to that. The dhikr is known. There's nothing wrong with the timing. And that's all fine. So tariqahs, they were something that came later on. And they were accepted. I'm not, when I say later on, I'm not trying to put them down or saying that you know it's like some bad bid'ah. But my point is that the sawuf is not something that requires tariqah. And Tariqa came later. That's just a historical fact. So none of these Sufi Tariqas have any chain that goes back to the Prophet ﷺ. Anyone who presents that, they're presenting a false chain. So these Tariqa, these Turuk, uh, which is the plural of Tariqa, they existed and, you know, that's fine. And they would have their own codified way of... Um, for spiritual practices, things that were beneficial for the soul. And, and again, that's all fine. And one central component to that was what what's called a Sheikh Murabi, a guiding Sheikh um, who would guide people through different, what they would call stages of the soul and spiritual experiences and give them different uh, litanies, athkar to do and so forth. So that's that's how the Sufi Turuk would practice um, the Sawuf. And then as time went on, there was a pretty... So, but again, these two veins always existed. The Sawuf outside of Tariqa and the Sawuf in Tariqa. It was never just something limited to Tariqa. Tariqa is not necessary to reach Ihsan at all. Again, proof of that being that Turuk came later on. And then the people of Tariqa themselves, people like Sidi Ahmed Zuruk and others, said that the age of Taslim is over, right? The age of perfect submission to the Shaykh. But they did not abrogate these tariqas. And this is an important point because sometimes people will quote Sidi Ahmad Zuruk as some sort of proof against the Sufi tariqas, which is problematic because he himself was a Shaykh of Tariqa. And he himself was a murid of a Shaykh of Tariqa, right? So he, he didn't end the institution of Tariqa. He just kind of refined how it should be taken. And he's not the only one. And Pretty much saying that the that um, there should not be blind following of the sheikh, and even the term blind following when it's used, it was always understood that you know the people hearing this were people of knowledge, and they understood it didn't literally mean like follow anything. Although that did exist through through history as well, like extremes and blind following, uh, even in the haram. But that's essentially how this is a very 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 simple version of how, what the tariqas practiced and practiced now and you know again if the tariqas are following sharia 
uh, and the people currently in charge understand the drop off in the caliber of the shoe, then you know that's a valid way of practicing tasawuf. With you, um, well, whilst you were studying in Mauritania, would you say that um, it was uh, the tarikas were a sort of a component in terms of your studies as well, or was it so more so? As you just kind of alluded to, I might be misinterpreting where mentioning it's it's not necessary for you know to have a tarika to sort of reach ihsan in some um, situations. So it's like, would you say that the tarika sort of way of doing things was um, a component to um, seeking knowledge um, in the way that you did? Um, for example, when you're in Mauritania. And I want to also emphasize that, you know, we shouldn't just say that Tariq is not necessary for Ihsan. I mean, the because again, the soul of Ihsan all just existed before Tariqas. So that, that shouldn't even have to be said. The Turuk came later on. Um, so it's it's one way, ideally, um, Tariqa, but it's not we shouldn't even see not having Tariqa as the exception. Um, so I want to first make that point. And second, no, um, so in Timra, like Murat al-Hajj and the other shiuch of that area and from, you know, the ones I was around, they they do not have Tariqa, no. Okay, fair enough, because... Yeah. But but I visited a, a sheikh like Muhammad Hasla Khadim. He's a Tijani sheikh. He's, he's a great scholar as well. And, and I have studied with other teachers and continue to some who have Tariqa. And like I said, it's not it's not something that's we shouldn't see them tariqa by default as being abusive or as being cold or anything like that. Because again, many they've revamped how they take tariqa, but there are a ton of charlatans in tariqa because of just you can imagine how easy it is um, to manipulate people through the institution of tariqa, especially when so much is based on the on just haphazard rules, things they make up as they go along, and the power trips people can go on. And, and how uneducated many of the murids even are, and just what they're seeking, and how easy it is to exploit what they're seeking. How would you say one can distinguish between like a more quote unquote like authentic tariqa compared to a, a charlatan one? So I mean, one thing to again is that the the tarikas, the healthy tarikas themselves, will tell you that the caliber just isn't really there of what was historical and. Literary, it mentioned like in the literature of of Tariqa. Just like, for example, you have Tabakat al Fukaha, like different stations and like Tabakat, like uh, like ranks and degrees of Fukaha, like the Mujtahid Mutlaq. You know, a person can have his own madhab and deduce direct from Quran and Sunnah, the Mujtahid Fil Madhab, and so on. Um, people with scholarship, Tashin, Tarji, then, then just the level that can determine what the stronger opinion is, what the weaker opinion is. And then just the total ami, right? The person who's just an average Muslim. Um, so, likewise, in in this institution of Tariqa, I mean, anybody who's saying that there should be blind submission, you just should not believe them. And really, the only um, clear, clear sign would be lying about an ijazah. But even then, I mean, practically speaking, when a sheikh lies about ijazah, it's interpreted as like, well, he got the ijazah through an ishara, or this is what he meant. It's a misunderstanding, or that ends up being true enough, you know. And these kind of signs, they just don't really do much for people unless they really see major issues. Because, for example, we'd say, okay, drawing a dichotomy from like the the in group and out group, okay, that's bad. But at the end of the day, any focused group is going to do that. The khas and awam dichotomy. That's even in fiqh, right? of kind of answers you give people, the khas and the wan, people who get waswasa, people who won't, for example. Um, really bad signs would be speaking ill of people who leave, um, sowing sedition between people, financial corruption, clear haram. And then clear haram is often justified as no one being perfect. And then if it's zina, you know, like it's it's man's weakness for a woman, then they'll tell stories of Oliya who committed zina. And even even in cases of homosexual acts of haram, people say no one's perfect, you know. So, really, I think just going in with the premise that that sheikh that you've read about in books does not exist is the best way to go about it. To be very learned in Sharia yourself, and to not be dependent, not looking for a guru figure. Um, and if you are to take tariqa, then to just look for someone who can help you out with afkar and spiritual progress. And is not creating any sort of dependency.
And, you know, there's a lot of stories, for example, of where the sheikh does something very questionable or outright haram, and then it becomes something opposite of what was apparent. So these type of stories put people in the mindset of suspending their judgment. And the more patient somebody is with suffering, the more patient somebody is with being quiet about haram, the greater the rewards will be. So then the object becomes loyalty to the person rather than following the sharia. And this is really how brains are rewired, you know. And it's very problematic. So you'll find stories of a sheikh committing zina, but it was just like an, a, vi- an, a vision, right? Like like suri, like just like like an image and not real. And then the people who still had a good opinion, they're the ones who were rewarded. And you just have a lot of lot of strange stories like this, you know. And, you know, it just kind of puts people in that mindset. So they'll tell you all these sort of stories. You'll, you'll hear stories of people even like just taking money from their murids, going in their house, selling everything they own, and then justifying abuse through that. And then the response to that would be that when there's that connection, there's something called zaradi. Like, like the sheikh would know that the student is completely all right with this. Therefore, it's not abuse. And that, that's predicated on a very closeness of relationship. And if the student does have a problem, that's where it's haram. So you can't justify someone having a problem with a story that's that's um, predicated upon the student not having a problem. Like there's a saying, "My be safe al haya haram." That what's taken with the safe, the, sorry, with the sword of modesty is haram. That you put somebody in a situation where they're reluctant to speak out, um, then then that's a type of um, hardship you're putting the person in, and that's not that's haram, even if the transaction is outwardly valid. And then again, the idea here is what's called taradi, mutual contentment. That's that's needed. And without that, these things are not permissible. So you cannot take the story of somebody going into his murid's house and selling everything they own, or selling even one thing they own, when that story is predicated on the sheikh knowing exactly how the murid would feel, and that being confirmed with somebody who does not allow this, you know, and then just citing that story as as a proof. That's that's a um, false analogy. SubhanAllah, like you, you really brought out some like crazy examples of um, situations of in within Tariqa SubhanAllah where basically the, the the teacher is taking advantage of the student, right? And I also wanted to, because I've done a lot of like sort of understanding and, and research when it comes to narcissism in general. But when, uh, I guess, when you mask it behind uh, religiosity, when you mask it behind um, the Islamic tradition, that's when it goes like, subhanAllah, that's where you can get some really wretched people where, as you just um, articulated, where they try to reinterpret the tradition in a way and package it to back to the students where it's justified. And then, um, because you can, if you want to, um, to a certain extent, right? And even to do straight um, haram things, but somehow weave and turn your way um, and, and find justifications in terms of that happening, even though it is clear-cut haram, where we, it kind of goes back to our earlier point about... Um, following the making sure we all follow the sharia etc but at the same time for example i've on a more lighter note and something that i've observed in my more so day-to-day i guess narcissism manifesting in different levels so one level that i have seen is for example um, a parent that is a, a narcissist will basically say to their kids oh um you know it, the Quran or, or the Sunnah teaches you to, you know, obey your parents or listen to them, right? And obviously it does, like no one's uh, denying that, but it becomes to the extent where uh, the kid can't even uh, say something in disagreement, in, even if it, even if it's in a polite manner, not asking, not getting angry and that kind of thing, or even disagreeing or sort of having that uh, healthy relationship that you would expect between uh, a... Um, a child and and a, and a and the parent, right? And I've actually seen this uh, myself in in terms of uh, distant sort of family friends, where that's happened, where the parent is basically in control, but then they're masking it behind the religiosity and justifying it so that they can have power and control. So I guess that is just one example, and that can manifest in uh, different ways, right? 
And would you say that in your situation, you've seen this uh, example of narcissism manifesting in different ways behind a sort of Islamic cloak, if you may call it like that? Yeah, and, you know, the, the whole point of manipulators, covert abusers, is they use good causes. They use good causes to harm others for personal gain. So, and, and the average person won't really pick up on this, oftentimes from their own goodness, right? So, for example, Shaitan says to Prophet Adam, alayhi salam, right? Like Allah says in the Quran, وَقَاسَمَهُمَا إِنِّي لَكُمَا لَمِنَ النَّاصِحِينَ That Shaitan took an oath to them and said, Indeed, I am from the ones giving you sincere counsel. And one of the tafsirs of that is like, like Prophet Adam, he didn't know what a lie was or that he didn't think somebody would lie about Allah. And then Surah Jinn, like what, what did the jinn say? وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يَقُولُ سَفِيهُنَا عَلَى اللَّهِ شَطَطَ وَأَنَّا ظَنَنَّا أَن لَن تَقُولَ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا That the jinn are saying that, you know, like سَفِيهُنَا that the shaitan said about said lies about Allah and we didn't think that any human or jinn would would lie about Allah so even the jinn who'd seen all sorts of you know wickedness and evil they didn't think somebody would lie about Allah so this isn't something that people really expect you know and that's really one of the problems of using good causes in general because people have a type of innocence and purity in mind about good causes and they're just shocked that people would use a good cause of, to harm others or for personal gain or for completely selfish motives and and you see this type of shock in different areas like even like activist circles for charities um you know programs to help children i mean you have you have abuse in all areas right and you you really get a lot of shock because people come to these with the type of purity in mind. And I'm not saying they're pure people in every aspect of life, but just like we take off our shoes when we go in the masjid, people, they have a certain respect uh, and esteem when they come to these altruistic causes. And they get very surprised that somebody could really be that twisted and demented, but they're there. And that's part of why it's easy to use good causes to abuse others because people don't expect it. Yeah, like even, for example, I've noticed where people who are generally uh, people pleasers in the sense that they aren't always thinking about themselves, but they're thinking about others around them and making sure uh, they are happy, for example. What happens is that narcissists tend to take advantage of those type of specific um, personality types and they can... So you, they try to, those narcissists specifically try to utilize as much power as they have in order to take advantage of people. And that's how they may at times, you know, create a sort of cult following um, at times. And it becomes even more dangerous where it sort of is hidden behind an Islamic language, Islamic um, language, where... Now you have all reigns to sort of take advantage and, and have that power over this person. And unfortunately, I wanted to get your thoughts on this, is that with narcissists, they will seek out um, powerful positions because, you know, it's all about the prestige. It's all about the power. And it, so hence, when they see there's a certain, for example, um, Islamic position, it could be in a tariqa, it could be in wherever, uh, it could be in a spiritual leadership sort of position in a, in a masjid, etc. They will see that this requires, uh, uh, this has, this specific position has a lot of prestige, a lot of um, power with that. So they'll actively at times, um, it may not be apparent to people around them, but from you know, sort of the, in, from the intentions, they'll seek out this position because they know the sort of respect and the power and the prestige it comes with it and i know it's a bad example i don't want to broad brush like um specific um occupations but i know like 
I've encountered myself, like very powerful positions in, in, in society, especially in our community where it's like, you know, doctors, lawyers, etc. You know, these narcissists at times will try to seek out those positions as much as possible because they know it comes with that power, prestige, etc. And so, you know, it becomes even dangerous. So what's your sort of opinion when it comes to what I just articulated about, you know, narcissists and people trying to seek out actively those um, powerful positions in order to take advantage of people it could be even from a spiritual perspective as well right so narcissists they do a lot of times people they're very narcissistic and corrupt to begin with right it's not something that happens and this is one of the hardest things for people to really grasp is you know we try to a lot of times put things in ways that serve as a warning for everybody and they can relate to us and be a cautionary tale for everybody rather than understanding that there really just are people who are not like others and the narcissist sees the world very differently now everybody could become a narcissist but there are people who are just like this right um martha stout estimated about four percent of the population and it's probably going to be higher just given social media and the and the narcissistic culture and how much that's just skyrocketing. And, you know, this is an important point for people to understand is that they often will, they'll go study, they'll go get a certificate because of how easy life is after that. And I mean, to be honest, you don't even need to study much to have these, this influence and power in these religious positions. You know, in many cases, unfortunately, even in these traditional circles, which claim to be so much about knowledge and ijazas, all you need is pictures with these people. Just put a picture with them. And then people assume that through osmosis, you were given the secret and now you're this inheritor. And, you know, just ha- get a testimonial. The sheikh praises you and has a picture and everyone's like, is going to be confused about the behavior. Oh, but this sheikh says this about him. Like that should never matter more than what you see. The Sharia is what you always judge by and character, you know, and when I say Sharia, I'm talking about like, like acceptable, good behavior, not just like random opinions here and there. So this is something that's very critical to understand is that there are people who understand when they see a Sheikh being respected, when they see people lining up to kiss someone's hand or serve them, they see, wow, this is awesome. I'm going to do this too. That's how they see these type of events and these type of atmospheres. If, if you see how easy it is and you want that, I mean, why would you not do this? So all the time people bring up, but I would never do that. I would never do like study the Quran. I would never study thing just for these things. And then my response is, well, imagine that's what you wanted and you saw how easy it is. That's the kind of personality you need to understand. And narcissists are very good cold readers. And the number one thing is information. If you have information on somebody, you know what their emotional strings are. You know how to manipulate them. You know which triggers to use on them. And the more people open up to you and tell you, well, this is what hurts me. You know, these type of people, they just make notes and know exactly how to play you, how to gather gather information. They'll tell you useless things about themselves that seem personal. So you share personal information back and they're collecting information. So... You know, you have to also understand that like these places, when they when someone says this is a safe space, I mean, just don't believe that. You should know somebody really well before you accept something. Like, like just someone has to say it's a safe space and you're going to open up and believe that. Like, what's that based on? And and this idea of being vulnerable. I mean, first of all, that's that's something people use for personal branding. Like, okay, I'm going to be vulnerable here. It's It's calculated. Because that type of stuff makes you relatable. This is good for, for like, um, like parasocial interaction is one of the terms used for social media interaction with people. It's this is the stuff that gets likes. It's not real vulnerability for people who are successful. They know how to use these things. And if you are actually think it's okay to just be vulnerable with people you don't know, you are asking to be manipulated. People have to be aware of this. And it's, it's again, the standards are very low. And a person doesn't even need high influence or high power. There's that motivation, like you mentioned, to just be respected, to have that uh, grandiosity. So people, they can just volunteer at a Sunday school or start a halakha in the masjid. 
And people are very happy that there's events going on in the masjid. And, you know, a lot of these uh, Islamic organizations, and I don't want to focus on masjids because it's these third spaces, the nonprofits, it's not just the masjid, it's the nonprofits, third spaces, halakas, you name it. I mean, a lot of them, you know, they want to get their brand out there as well. So if somebody is willing to put work in, they're going to get promoted and they're going to have people under them. And as long as most people are happy or enough people are happy, it won't matter who's not happy and who's being mistreated. And that's the reason a lot of abuse will be overlooked because it's good for the brand and they don't want to lose these type of things. And these people can be very charismatic. They sell tickets. And, you know, people will not want to lose those things over people who are abused, unfortunately. I know this. Uh, the way I might ask this might sound a bit blunt or crude, but wouldn't you say, like you mentioned uh, early, earlier about in terms of uh, narcissists getting that certificate or degree um, so that their life is easier after. Wouldn't you say even in Islamic circles or even in, I don't know, for example, in Mauritania or people who travel overseas to study, it may be at times uh, a hotbed of narcissists because that's exactly what those narcissists will try to do, like try to get that certificate at all costs in order to, so that, you know, life can be better for them. They can have that sort of um, religious standing within the community when they do come back um, to the West, for example. Yeah, that happens all the time. <laughs> like, I'm glad you brought that up. I don't know why that's a problematic question. SubhanAllah. It, people, I mean, you have uh, revered senior scholars in the Muslim world. You go there, you, sp you spend some time there, you take pictures, you get a close relationship, you translate for them or whatever. And then everything you do in these type of circles will be like, but he's close to this sheikh, but this sheikh said, said, said this about them. And then there's these assumptions that they have all this firasa and basira, or, you know, and, and they don't judge by the sharia. They don't judge just as humans with boundaries, of, with dignity. And this is what I said very early on about the strong sense of self, even in the children in Mauritania. And in the West, a lot, like by and large, we don't have that. So when people are mistreated, I mean, they go seek validation. If you're punched in the face, don't go to some sheikh and say, did he really punch me in the face? You better know he punched you in the face. And, and you should know how to feel about that. But when people need validation at that level, it's just so easy to manipulate. And this is why we, we have such, we have the mess that we do. Because again, there's something that they think they need to reconcile between them being around these great olia and these great scholars and what they're doing. Like, what is there to reconcile? There's nothing to reconcile. And, and that begins with a strong sense of self. And, and, you know, people have said things like, oh, but why did the sheikh like teach? I mean, go to a madrasa, go to the Muslim world. You're not going to turn people down. It's not like just there's a piety test to teach people. Not at all. And there could be many explanations. One, the, the sheikh could just not know what's going on. They only see the best side of these individuals. Or, I mean, they don't care. I mean, all of these are possibilities. But you need to have confidence in what's right and what's wrong. And just like we talked a lot about spiritual experience not being a criterion, some sheikh validating somebody does not make wrong right. And we have to be confident about that. And one of the big issues, like in Tariqa, is if the sheikh has ijazah. I mean, an ijaza is something that needs to be lived up to. So, I mean, if someone has an ijaza, and, and, what, and what I mean is an ijaza in Tariqa, right? Like, that doesn't mean that anything goes. It's like having a driver's license. That's an ijaza from the state to drive a car. But if you become a reckless driver, you will lose that license. You don't tell the cop, but I have a license. Judge, I have a license, so I could drive however I want. No, you fail to live up to that license and to and to hold yourself to that license. So you lose it. Same thing with the Nijaz and Tariqa. If you don't live up to it, it's meaningless. Mm, SubhanAllah. Uh, those are beautiful insights because uh, why I was hesitant uh, earlier to sort of say in an open manner is because some people, I've always found this to be a, a recurring theme, if anything. Um, and I'll, I'll be a bit open about this because, uh, like, you know, mashallah, like, uh, locally, I do have... Um, very high learned students of knowledge that I um, go to for rulings, for example, right? And I sort of pick out the ones that I know that are, you know, and I can trust them in terms of character, sincerity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And at times, it's not uh, what happens is like clicks of uh, students of knowledge, for example, or um, what do you call it? 
groups at times i can see it as almost like a cult where it's like if i say something like this they'll be like you know uh don't you have respect um you know for students of knowledge or respect for these um institutions that you know try to do the best for the all my etc etc so it kind of uh they throw the sort of other card back at you in, in terms of these discussions and then it's it, it's sort of a way to shut you down you're just like ah oh, okay yeah fair enough etc etc and um yeah, that, that's sort of been my experience at times uh, in terms of encountering or navigating these conversations within those circles, right? Um, would you say you, you've had that similar experience where, because how you've articulated, mashallah, you know, you're very open and honest. You've talked about your uh, experiences uh, studying and, you know, mashallah, you're giving us insights about, you know, spiritual experiences, etc. And, you know, how what is and an is a spiritual experience and criterion for, you know, everything and uh in terms of the shia etc but then you're also talking about this important topic in terms of you know um narcissism and within even islamic um spaces so would you say like you've also been uh, other people have tried to shut you down regards to these conversations because it's like okay um you know you're talking bad about these which you're not but they'll sort of make it as if you are uh, talking bad it's like no it's only just a a small uh few people don't um make that you know as as a way to depict you know these institutions like this etc etc well to be honest with you a lot of so again most of the teachers that i know they're all well aware of these issues and like when i talk to them they'll have stories for me and i and i'm kind of the guy that they vent to (laughs) about like other abusive situations they'll hear about and I mean, I get a lot of thanks from this, uh, from teachers. Um, like I'm just recently, one, one like Sheikh I met with, he, he told me, he says, you know, what, what you're doing, I just see it as wajib. And I've been told that many times from different scholars. And they, look, they know these problems. Anyone who's been involved in community issues and organizing and around these in particular traditional circles, they just know how bad these issues are. They know how easy it is, how people just start their own groups, their own, th- their, you know, whether that does or not in the historicas, and they know what they do to people. So I've been, like, alhamdulillah, honestly, met with a lot of things for, for what I do and people telling me it was much needed. And, you know, I, I'll get a lot of help, too, like in researching certain things, um, people mentioning issues to me, things of that nature, because it's it's no secret. It's no secret at all. It, like I'm saying, like we really need to focus on how easy it is, and again, people understand that and they take advantage of it. So for the people who see how easy it is, there's going to be nothing to stop them. And again, these things are known. So I and I and I would like to ask you, like, like why were you reluctant to to mention that at first about people going overseas just for that? I think my honestly like if i were be to be um very uh, open and honest um i guess my perspective has always been when it comes to islamic tradition always a deep love and respect for scholars etc um that's n- no doubt about that um at the same time the sort of perspective uh, this isn't necessarily in regards to um uh seeking knowledge but in terms of other, utilizing other um, ways of uh, other knowledge or other uh, sort of knowledges that I've accumulated could be through philosophy etc um, I've always tried to um, gather the or as much noise as I can in these sort of fields and sort of you know gather as much noise from the Islamic side and um, really uh, almost p- sort of navigate my uh, Islam in, in that manner try to just gather as much knowledge and do that so I guess what sometimes happens in those situations is that I'm not really part of the very, you know, the ilmi knowledge, mashallah, crowd where, yeah. you know, they, they study hard and uh, hadith, fiqh, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, I've never really been able to um, be in those circles to the fullest. If anything, I've always had friction with them because, like, for example, uh, this is a very personal example. Um, I've actually talked about this quite a lot uh, recently where... Um, 
in terms of like certain rulings like uh, one personal one is like because i have a younger sister um you know the hanafi ruling on taking uh, uh females being in the masjid um is is a bit stricter and for example my sort of um approach is more so okay look you know the situation in the west it's not that good um you know my younger sibling has to sort of go to the masjid to seek knowledge etc etc so when you tell that to a very kind of staunch hanafi um that becomes problematic or even that's just one very small example but another example is a very local one where uh, mashallah there's um locally here in uh I'll, I'll be open i can be open about this like mizan avenue you know um they uh, locally here in sydney they actually um, provide um lessons and um you know courses on on very important islamic you know they they do like aqida fiqh etc at the same time um what happens is that because they don't have like a a barricade between uh, males and females um some like very staunch uh I'll, I'll, it's probably not the right word to describe them but staunch uh, uh students of knowledge they'll be i've had this experience so many times like stuck for Allah, you know what are they doing you know they don't don't they aren't they following you know the sunnah etc and very hardcore like as if you know they have that sort of flag of deen you know waving it around and sort of acting in a manner where you know they're actually going contrary to islam etc etc and so that's they act like that and then it's like they don't attend uh those sort of um you know courses etc because of that right and sort of almost depict them as if there's some liberals going around which is like suck for not definitely not the case right it's just that one thing which is like they don't the males and female side don't have a barricade it's literally like the only thing so like for me like i'm just like look i get i understand like your perspective like you know um in terms of uh the rulings that you follow etc you know it's this particular ruling does not fit that i definitely get that at the same time you know i'm more about understanding the situation and the place and the time where you know there's some horror stories that i've heard especially in very um uh in different mosques when it comes to um you know the the strict sort of way that you know the divisions within the masjid and how at times um people walking in doesn't set a good sort of example in terms of how we uh treat males and females like at times like i know i'm going on a very spiel but it really hits home for me personally because for example um, sometimes the female section in a masjid is like small and um and you don't have access to the sheikh at all right so for a new muslim or someone coming to islam or is muslim but doesn't know much about deen and they just want to learn it becomes very very problematic right very 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 problematic so it's like that's why these sort of um uh, circles and and these sort of institutions like mizan avenue actually facilitate a better um access to the sheikh for example so that's why like something like a barrier and stuff that's why i understand you know i'm not going to be staunch about it, like oh stuck for this and that i'm always going to be understanding and anyways like there is other you know i've talked to other sheikhs and they've sort of let it they're a bit more um uh loose about at this because they understand the sort of situation we live in the west so for me it's like when i navigate these circles i'm always in at odds with such um groups and and people who have studied the tradition i'm always in conflict if anything uh for a lot of the time and that's why it becomes difficult to have these sort of discussions because it kind of um you know they they have this like sort of banner of islam and be like you know you know we're protecting protecting the deen and you know this is happening and why are you at odds with us and it's, it's almost like a way to guilt trip into thinking you're a lesser muslim you know um so that's why i'm always hesitant sometimes because like i i feel for them but at the same time i'm always at contest with them um even though i have respect for what they're doing and the sort of knowledge they have but at the same time it's like um i'm at the end of the day you know i I'm going to take a slightly different path to them if that makes sense. So does it stand out to you when they say things like don't don't speak to a student of knowledge like this and they're kind of upping themselves? I think they I wouldn't say maybe they say that bluntly but I do think that they they yeah they sort of definitely imply that in a um in a more like implicit manner where it'd be like you know what you, you always have to think about the best of like everyone and you know in those sort of circles and why are you sort of um going against what this person has said and that person says and it comes becomes like a um back and forth in that manner in order to tr- try to make you sort of um uh, feel bad about your sort of stance if that makes sense but that that sentence no, definitely exists. yeah 
so, so you're saying like these aren't exactly your circles. So you're you're kind of um, an outsider to begin with. So you don't have that high comfort level. Hundred percent. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So what's your sort of? <laughs> do you, have you had these sort of situations yourself or not? Not really. Sorry, what kind of situations? Like, I guess what I just described in my own um, setting where um, you become at odds at times with certain um, students of knowledge and their circles. And so you're sort of left to sort of navigate. Like, I I just gave an example with, like, for example, the barricade thing. I don't know, like, what's your take on that, for example? But, like, I guess certain rulings that you may take that may be at odds with another sort of um, circle or another, or even specific rulings that may be at odds um directly but you understand yeah, there's mean, a wisdom to that because of the time and place etc i mean those things aren't really in line with abuse and stuff you know if people are able to differ and disagree with respect and you know it's important to not think that we have to become like moral relativists and always accommodate everybody um, i think there needs to be an open-mindedness about different cultures as well in like subcultures that exist so you know, for example, in the Bay Area, I mean, you're going to have places that have uh, that are more conservative, and other places that are not. And I, and I, you know, I think it's good to understand all of that. To be honest with you, and I'm not trying to give like a PC answer, but I really mean that <laughs> because, uh, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I think one thing that's not often understood is a lot of cases the sisters want the separate space, you know, um, and in some cases not but i i don't think we should there, there's there's got to be other elements too right in terms of people knowing how to conduct themselves and i think so i mean i've seen cases i've seen cases um three come to mind where the person giving the lecture about you know we don't need dividers and men and women just need to be mature and it's these it's these uh, men who don't know how to interact with women that they just don't, they just, uh, they're perverted and they're, that's why they want dividers. And all three of them ended up having scandals later on, you know, with women. And this isn't to say that everybody who pushes for no dividers has that agenda, but, you know, there's always an angle, right? So you're going to have these more, permissive uh circles where you know they want to act like men this is it's just immaturity to have um some separation between men and women and and this isn't something any mature person needs you know and that that's just wrong <laughs> so in terms of my question would be how do we go about applying uh islam uh, in the modern day and age in the sense for example sp- like it's hard to sometimes um, make that balance between you don't want to just fully be accommodating in every aspect of the tradition and uh, for because of the current times but at the same time you don't want to uh, be too h- harsh and, and the way that Islam is sort of um, portrayed you don't want to be uh, too strict with it right like even um one example that kind of springs to mind is uh, I think the Shafi ruling on uh, buying and selling and trading is like um, you have to see the product in, in person. You have to actually see it for yourself. But then, you know, the day and age of, you know, internet buying and selling and stuff, it that kind of throws that out of the window. But at the same time, I think some people won't look to that ruling anymore, right? So I guess like how would you say um, can there be a, a balance sort of established between um, s- rulings being applied in this day and age um, from the Islamic perspective versus um, being accommodating um, for the time and place? Well, fiqh is always supposed to be accommodating to time and place. Like it's madhahib, they're continuous schools, right? Um, So a lot of times where people don't think there's an answer, I mean, they might just not know really where to look i mean one simple example you mentioned transactions would be like some people i remember i remember them saying for example that for a transaction you know there has to be ijab and qubul 
So if you just go to the store and the person doesn't talk and you just purchase something or you just buy something and leave money, that's not a valid transaction, which is completely wrong. And it's called Sa'ati in the Hanifi school, where you can just pay something and leave the money on the counter. And there's no conversation. It's not ijab and qubul, right? It's called ta'ati. Like you just put the money there and you and you buy it and you take it. So sometimes people will make these statements because they won't have enough knowledge, you know. Um, other times they won't really know how to apply fiqh. And, and their idea of fiqh is something from the pre-modern world. But again, I mean, you won't find this amongst Urdama, really. From... So the scholars that I've uh, listened to, some of them, what I have felt was that they discussed that, for example, if they studied from Medina University or Al-Azhar, etc., um, they come back to the West and uh, give rulings because, you know, they're um, in a position to do so. But what they find is that they end up, you know, they, they're a bit more staunch in the way they give rulings. But then, you know, some of them mentioned like six years later, they actually give a, a different sort of ruling to the same situation they gave six years ago because you know of the time and place and how difficult it might be at times and would you say that we're still in this phase of you know trying to um we're uh, you know navigating how to apply like the the fiqh um in within uh this modern day and age especially in the west you know to be honest with you i think a lot of issues also come from people studying coming back and not looking at what's not being in touch with other people giving fatawa and understanding issues and they might not have people above them or they might not be in touch with their teachers and might not be trained well enough. That's that's something we really have to consider. They may not be trained well enough to think on their own, to apply things uh, to or to consult with teachers and then think for themselves. And depending on which people you're around, you'll have disparities in this so there there are also very good efforts of people who have been answering questions a lot longer um who then provide mentorship this stuff i've seen from people who will have recently finished their studies um and for this reason um people that i know they've preferred to do their ifta actually like you know kind of getting that proficiency in answering questions and looking into new matters in america because they're able to study with those who have been more experienced in America answering these kind of questions. So I, I think if a person has the intention and the ability to work with people who have been doing this and can they can consult with them and look at issues rather than just answering everything on their own and not being in touch with their teachers or peers or mentors, then there's a greater likelihood of um, kind of messing up and then it's always going to be about you know as you mentioned like years later people realize their mistakes but there is a way to be there, there, there is a methodology you can follow as I mentioned to not make these kind of mistakes and, and a lot of that is just uh, humility and having humility as your disposition another question that kind of springs to mind as well is I know of um Sheikhs as well that mentioned that okay they studied all this stuff which is great huh, mashallah, uh, from these institutions and they come back but then in reality most of the questions that they encounter um, from the people from the Muslim community is more you know it could be specific I think uh, Sheikhs actually this specific Sheikh that comes to mind mentioned he, he was bombarded with all his marriage uh, stuff right so it's like you went to the sort of institutions to learn islam and deen and stuff but then you come back but it's like completely not in your sort of domain if anything when it comes to dealing with marriage situations etc um or it could be even any other situation and um what happens is that i guess some sheikhs sort of take that on board and um sort of handle those situations when they don't have the expertise but i guess I, even locally now i know that some sheikhs actually um because I in a, my sort of local masjid, there's actually a counselor that is um he does his own counseling, but he's also connected to the masjid. So he kind of um, the sheikh sort of uh, allocates those kind of scenarios or situations to the counselor to figure those situations out. And when it comes to may specific rights from the Islamic um, tradition, then the sheikh sort of gives his opinion. But in terms of sorting sorting out the actual marriage situation, the relationships, etc., um, it kind of is uh, at times 
uh, sheikhs actually take those kind of responsibilities on board and figure that out. So have you had these sort of um, experiences with your own people in terms of, you know, sheikhs actually having to uh, end up dealing with um, situations or scenarios that actually wasn't um, what they were, um, you know, what they encountered when they were um, studying in, in certain institutions overseas? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times people, they won't know what they're, if they become an imam or take a vocational role, they won't really know what they're getting into. Sometimes, you know, um, and other times they will be well prepared for it. it. Some of that also depends where they study, because some places will prepare you better than other places. And it really just comes back to the ability to say, La adri, I don't know. And as long as a person is aware of their limitations and knows where to consult, even for major fatwa issues, you know, like you might want to look, depending on the situation, like consult with people of a different madhab, you know, and kind of, um, or people who know how to research really well, for example, and and have that kind of shura of or that consultation of what's most appropriate for this circumstance. And again, as long as you have that procedure, you're able to say, I don't know, um, you don't overstep, you don't feel like you have to answer everything, a person will be in a, in a good place. And it goes both ways. I mean, you, you see a lot of mental health professionals, unfortunately, using mental health as a way to become like Sufi sheikhs. Like they treat mental health as if it's the sawuf. And there's a lot of, you know, um, overstepping qualifications everywhere i know we're talking about religious figures but like when you look at just religious preaching in general i mean you have this is getting more and more common in mental health mental health professionals speaking a lot about spirituality and islam and the soul of things of that nature so really i mean just being able to say i don't know consulting um being able to work with people who may know something more than you in an issue just having that disposition of humility uh, that that really will save people from a lot of problems for sure that it's very important that you brought that up in terms of um knowing what you don't know and it, it go, kind of goes back to our narcissism talk where at times you know i think it's probably it's probably dangerous as any if anything if if you spend uh, all this time with a certain sheikh and stuff and they don't even utter obviously like it depends um you know it could be a very knowledgeable sheikh so obviously he'll know but you have that famous story of i think it was imam malik for example where a, a person from a different um part of the world came to him and asked all these questions and i think he said i don't know many times and it sort of reflects how um we should always be in that state right uh of giving out or uh, advising people if we do have the knowledge to do so if we don't then we just say i don't know and that's like a way to it's sort of a reflection of, of the ego at times, right? Or the humbleness um, in terms of when it comes to Islamic tradition, treating it with the uh, the adab, you know, because you don't want to misinterpret and um, mess up a situation because of what you think and what you sort of um, having a sort of a guesswork at when it comes to what the tradition speaks about this particular topic. So, I mean, also it's it can come from a very good place that's not egotistical and just not really know knowing what to do in a certain situation. So, for example, when people are dealing with cults, right? I mean, you'll have some people who just kind of say, this is a cult, leave it. That's not really how you handle cult situations. Um, so, one, I mean, one common thing is like when, when parents reach out or family members reach out saying one of their you know family members has joined a cult, one of the most important things to tell them is not to, not to badmouth the cult leader because you're just going to create a rift between uh, your relative and the leader. But people who don't know that, they won't know that. And they might say, well, you have to like get into these debates and prove this and prove that. But that's not that's generally not advisable. And it's that's not about narcissism or anything, you know. That's just thinking that saying the truth is gonna solve the issue. But you're dealing with a different kind of mentality. For sure. Um thank you for those insights actually in terms of um cult and having to deal with that situation. How would you advise them specifically in terms of if you know a, a close family or friend that may be involved in a cult, um, how would you advise them to go about it specifically? So every situation will be unique. Um, but again, one general thing would be again not to badmouth the cult leader because that will just create a rift. 
And even initially, when when the person brings up certain issues that they're experiencing with the cult leader or in the group, to not mention, like, see, I told you, I knew it, I didn't want to tell you, but this is what he's doing to you. Because when there's that distance and the person's, like, let's say, going to go back to that group, they will, they're likely to see you as the enemy very quickly. And then the leader, the cult leader can get those, all those, that information out very quickly out of the person. So what else did your mom say to you? What else? And then, and then create a deep rift between uh, the person and the family. And this is, this is done commonly. So it would be better to just say, that's strange. That's interesting. Well, don't you find that odd? Things of that nature being a little bit more Socratic generally. That's, that's a lot better. And again, these are delicate situations and, and there will be differences in the particular, but that's pretty good general advice. Mashallah, yeah, for sure. You don't want to go too, you know, in the in your in their face, and you don't want to go too um, if a bit aggressive. And because no one reacts well in that situation, it's like normal human behavior. Especially if someone is, for example, in a cult and they respect their leader a lot, just going up to and be like, you know, saying X Y Z in a very harsh manner is not going to really do anything, right? It's just gonna it's going to make them even more <laughs> firm on what their sort of belief is, right? Or what they think about the shakes. Like, no, no, they'll try to defend it at all costs. It doesn't really create a um, a healthy sort of uh, situation in that particular instance. Exactly, yeah. So in terms of, like we mentioned narcissism before, I, I want to also ask you, because it's interesting that I've actually, I don't know if it ties in with what I just mentioned earlier about um, certain students of knowledge in, in certain groups. Um, I feel that I have experienced a, a sort of narcissism, even in the way they may uh, go about things, um, in the way they approach um, situations. But um, what I wanted to ask is, for example, there might be a, reput a reputable sheikh, a, a scholar of a high standing. And what may happen is that there may be they they have students or or people uh, who who study under him that utilize the the sheikh's um, reputation to their own advantage in front of others and advance their own agenda, right? So would you say that that has occurred and that's a form of narcissism that exists within our, our community? And what are your thoughts about that? Right, event organizers, people who are close to the sheikh. Um, haven't studied anything even, you'll find a lot of times they use the sheikh, the sheikh's popularity, the respect he gets as ways to build their own brand and to have their own social importance. And, and you'll see a lot of times, you know, people, they really want social importance. I mean, just that idea of walking into a gathering and people standing up for you, coming up to meet you in gatherings, you know, that's thrilling. And, you know, most people don't like going unnoticed and being nobodies. So social significance is a big driver for, for people. So, you know, you'll have people who just become middlemen and they'll say, okay, no one, no one walk, talk to the sheikh right now. The sheikh needs to leave. And everybody don't ask a sheikh the question right now. And they just insert themselves in the middle. They block people from asking a question. They block people from talking to the sheikh. And they just love being important and creating roles for themselves. And they're, they're often just really obnoxious people who want that social role. And they, they'll they have their own brand from it sometimes, you know. And you, you, you can look around and see this. I mean, people whose really only qualification is being in the company of, of somebody, not even learning, right? And then there's this assumption, again, a lot in these like traditionalist type circles, of well, he collected the gems, you know. So it's no formal learning, but it's just wisdom was shared. You have something. You're in a stat now, and you know you'll see this type of stuff quite often, of, of being very exclusive, and and just not wanting other people to benefit. And that goes back to their own importance in these circles. And this is just one of the unfortunate irony in these circles that claims to be so much about knowledge and sitting at the feet of scholars and having ijazas as a way of preserving their religion. But the, the real ijaza ends up being loyalty to the right figures, subservience, service, flattery, and just being around the right personalities. 
that's really important that you brought that up because I actually have <laughs> seen that sort of scenarios and situations, not just from myself, but people have recounted it to me. Where it was really interesting you brought up, like the middleman, like there's a sheikh and then this guy is just sort of there and you know he probably gets a high off it if anything because all these people are like seeing him as the middleman and they're going up to him and be like you know this and that and can i talk to this sheikh and but they're like uh depending on the situation they might say no but you know you can um sort of i don't know for example uh, spend time with me and then uh, i'll be able to tell you things that the sheikh has said or something to that effect or even now uh, with event organizers like they just become uh the person that everyone sort of goes to and that builds up their prestige and they have a more of a spotlight so at times i guess people really enjoy that situation and being in that scenario so uh it's unfortunate and we, i guess as a community we have to navigate the spaces and it's hard sometimes because uh the sheikh i don't like would you say the sheikh has a responsibility to pick up on these things and sort of act accordingly and sort of uh weed out such such characters or is it sort of uh, incumbent on on the community to understand that these dynamics are unhealthy and that we should be in the right right frame of mind uh, and understand these uh, potential scenarios and to um, avoid them or or not give these type of characters the time of day. You know, I'm not a fan of putting things on other people. To be really honest with you, I think I think we need to see this and tell people that you're just not that important. Like one of my friends, he, he told me a really funny story. He was talking about one of these middlemen who was organizing an event for a very well-known sheikh. And he just went on this power trip as an organizer, bossing people around. And my friend told him, he said, look, you realize you're not the reason people are coming, right? This is like the Olympics. Like people would come regardless of how well it's organized. And they're coming because of the sheikh and he could sell out any venue. So calm down. And he said the organizer talked to him differently though after that, you know. And I think it's really our responsibility to stand up when we see this stuff, not let it slide. Because the fact of the matter is, look, the sheikh himself is likely in the best case scenario, see the best side of such a person and just not really be aware of it. And if he is aware of it, I mean, like, again, as adults, why are we going to somebody else, right? We should have that sense of self and to and to check that ourselves. That's healthy checks and balances in society. Um, especially if it's not like, you know, him putting him, putting the person up as a muqaddam or as a khalifa in a tariqah, you know, that, that's not really something he's responsible for. And we should be people who, who really feel that sense of responsibility ourselves and just understand what comes off of this because people build their own sub-brands under a sheikh, right? So you'll, you'll have... I mean, you'll see this if you look for it. You know, people, their only qualification, as I mentioned, is allegedly collecting these gems and then they become ustadas and ustad in, ironically, the communities that purport to be about knowledge. So, no, we should check that ourselves when we see it. For sure. And it, that story you just mentioned, that's really interesting because even in my experience, I've found that when you uh, engage or interact with a narcissist, what really uh, is there, what do you call it, a weak spot of theirs or something that really hits closer to home is if you actually, the, the, I guess when you go, if you want to go for the jugular vein, if you can call it that, is if you <laughs> sort of question their uh, importance or question their sort of prestige, like, or if or almost quote unquote, like ask them out in front of others, where if that's sort of at times uh, what they uh, want and strive to, to have, so if you attack that, like, you know, you, as your friend just questioned the importance of that guy, it's like, look, dude, you're not, you know, important. You know, all these people want to go to share. That just kind of puts them in the corner, right? Or even, uh, for example, uh, I've had this situation. Uh, I won't go into the details, but um, what happened was there was a, a narcissist guy that was um, taking advantage of like a marriage situation. And what the person who was... Uh, the who, who was sort of in, uh, interacting and trying to solve the situation he basically told him look um i'm gonna expose you to everyone and i'm going to tell you uh, tell people how much of a fraud you are because of xyz and then he just like basically shut up and um you know it sort of got to him if anything so um i guess it's always important to note that that's how 
um, at times, uh, that's the weak spot of the narcissist at times. Yeah, and you know, I would just add that there, there is, you know, something we'd call narcissism in terms of you know just when a person's really into themselves. But then there's narcissistic personality disorder, and you know, sometimes people don't have that, or a lot of times, but they're just on power trips, you know, and they could be brought back down a lot quicker. And the reason it's important to know more about narcissistic personality disorder is just to understand, you know, what I always try to emphasize is these people, they don't have moral breaks. Um, they can present the right emotion without sincerely feeling it, make you feel guilty for you thinking bad of them when you see clear wrong, things of that nature. But not everybody who exhibits these kinds of behavior has narcissistic personality disorder. And ultimately, it doesn't matter because you look at behaviors and you don't try to psychoanalyze people. But in general, yeah, when somebody is being a bully, you should stand up to them and respond. And in some cases, they'll fight you tooth and nail. In other cases, all they need to see is you're not easy prey. And ultimately, you know, we need to establish these checks and balances. Definitely, that's a that's a great reminder in terms of I guess it's it all comes kind of comes down to also the individual having that self worth and having that sort of backbone and, and trusting. I kind of you you alluded to a lot earlier in the episode where sometimes people uh, go to others in terms of um, validation, but it's about trusting your own uh, feelings or situations or how you felt if someone wronged you rather than sort of going to someone to sort of get confirmation if that really that guy really did wrong on on. On, the, on themselves right so it's about kind of building those characteristics of a person and becoming balanced and having that courage um, as well and those definitely help when it comes to understanding these kind of uh, dynamics between people and relationships and a narcissist potentially taking uh, advantage of them and so I think there's a it, it kind of speaks to a broader point about um, growth of a human being and, and personality and becoming a better person and for some personality types that's sort of battles that they have to encounter or else people will take advantage of them and will see them um, as easier prey like some people I know they don't set boundaries uh, this is more of a uh, different sort of example but kind of place to my uh, sort of as to my broader point where you know they don't they always say yes to what everyone asks them to do and they don't set boundaries and it becomes easier for them to be taken advantage of straight away so you know it's difficult you can't just go up to someone and be like you know change your ways or whatever you know it, it takes some sort of level and growth and i guess that's what we do have to also do as a community as well Alhamdulillah. But uh, Jazakallah Khair for coming on uh, Boys in Cave. I really, really uh, enjoyed this discussion. It was really the way we just saw, it was very natural. And at the same time, we were able to discuss important points about spirituality, which I haven't really, uh, probably haven't discussed to this extent in other podcasts. I have done other podcasts about spirituality, but the way we dissected it and brought different ideas and the co concept of following the Sharia, we kind of unpacked it. I thought it was really, really well done, Alhamdulillah. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences as well uh, when you studied overseas. I think it gives a lot of um, listeners and viewers an insight into um, studying overseas and their experiences and also in terms of being aware of things such as um, narcissism and having an understanding of how, uh, you know tharikas and how it functions and our great objective at the end of the day so thank you for sharing your thoughts and experiences and your knowledge um, today i really enjoyed it as well thank you thank you very much so for our listeners Thank you for giving us your attention. If you have any questions or queries, feel free to email us at infoboysinthecave.com or you can follow us on Facebook and follow our journey through Instagram. Please give a five-star rating on iTunes because that greatly helps us. So from our special guests, Danish Qasim and myself, Tanzim, we wish you all the best. This is Tanzim signing off. Assalamualaikum. alaikum